You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Three hundred and fifty million people around the world suffer from depression. That number is increasing compared to population. Depression costs two hundred and ten billion dollars a year in the U.S. alone, including workplace costs, direct healthcare costs, and costs related to suicide, lost connections, uncovering the real causes of depression, and the unexpected solutions. Explores this topic. If you've ever suffered from depression, or if you're just interested to know why it's on the rise, this book is a must-read. The thrust of it can be contained in a single question: Is everything we know about depression wrong? Author and London-based journalist Johann Hari was diagnosed with depression in his late teens. His doctor told him that his symptoms were caused by a chemical imbalance in his brain. He took antidepressants in different forms and doses for over a decade, in what he calls the age of Prozac. But later, Hari was puzzled by three things: first, why was he still depressed? Second, why did depression seem to be on the rise generally? And third, could something other than brain chemistry be responsible? In this book, Insight, we'll explore three major themes from Hari's book. First, we'll look at antidepressants and how they work. Hari argues they're not effective for most people. Secondly, we'll look at the true causes of depression. These are nearly all external forms of disconnection. And third, we'll hear seven alternative forms of antidepressant, which center on Hari's central theme of connection. We'll start with why the drugs aren't working. Here's Hari speaking for Big Talk on what he learned from traveling the world, studying the science and treatment of depression. They found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. It's dealing with the reasons why they were so depressed and anxious in the first place. Everywhere I went in the world, I found that the most effective strategies with depression and anxiety were the places that were dealing with these deeper causes. Hari makes it clear that there's still a big debate among scientists about exactly how and whether antidepressants work. He focuses on a particular type, SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Hari visits Dr. Irving Kirsch of Harvard Medical School, whom he describes as the Sherlock Holmes of antidepressants. Kirsch conducted and published a now famous study in 2008. Showing that for people with non-severe depression, the majority of antidepressant success rate was down to the placebo effect, or just to the fact that some depression sufferers will improve over time by themselves. Drawing on Kirsch's work, Hari tells us that studies on antidepressants have been deeply skewed by the interests of the big pharmaceutical companies. These firms routinely present only the findings that support the drugs they're trying to bring to market. One Prozac trial tested the drug on 245 patients, but only published the results for the 27 patients for whom the drug was effective. He also mentions a well-known legal case against GlaxoSmithKline. GSK had to pay out after it was proven that the company hadn't shown that the SSRI paroxetine worked for adolescents, despite promoting it for use in that age group. Standard theory on depression. Says that it is caused by lowered levels of serotonin in the brain, which affect mood. Irving Kirsch and British psychiatrist David Healy have written about the links between antidepressants and suicide. They found no clinical basis for the serotonin theory, and Hari pronounces it scientifically dead. However, he admits that many medics and scientists dispute Kirsch's findings. And continue to advocate the use of antidepressants. People such as Dr. Peter Kramer argue that, along with talking therapies, antidepressants are a useful and proven tool in most kinds of depression. 
But Hari quickly moves on from such defenders and focuses on the side effects of antidepressants, including nausea, agitation, sleep problems, and loss of libido. Hari concludes that antidepressants might form part of a solution for a minority of patients and encourages readers to keep taking them only if the positives outweigh the side effects. But he thinks we need to look elsewhere for solutions. To explain what pushed him towards the concept of connection as an antidote to depression, Hari next explains the so-called grief exception. The DSM, or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, is the reference book used by American doctors to diagnose mental illness. The original edition listed nine possible symptoms of depression, and patients needed to display five of these to receive a diagnosis. But doctors started complaining that recently bereaved patients often showed at least five. Surely they were just grieving, not clinically depressed. It raised other important questions. Is grief really the only possible external trigger for depressive symptoms? What about losing your job or your house? Or the end of a long-term relationship? Life itself could be a key driver of the onset of depression. Hari looks at some 1970s studies of depressed women in Camberwell, then a deprived part of London. The studies had been the first to suggest that external factors might be a cause of depression. 68% of the women had experienced a major negative experience, and they were three times more likely to have experienced chronic stress during the year before their symptoms started. The researchers wondered whether clinical depression might just be an understandable response to adversity. Publications of other studies showed that environmental factors could cause depression, and formal psychiatric training is based on a three-part model of biological, psychological and social causes for the condition. Despite all this, scientific interest soon moved on to the new antidepressants. The big problem with clinical treatment of depression, Hari says, is that it seems to completely leave out context. None of the doctors Hari saw for his depression had asked him about his life circumstances. Surely these were important. Hari wondered if our societies had become so individualized that it begged the question, could depression be a kind of grief for lost social connection? We'll pause for now, but we'll pick up again on Hari's lost connection. Let's recap what we've learned. First, we covered how depression is a severely misunderstood condition. Our treatment and drugs aren't fully addressing the causes. Next time, we'll look at some of the true causes of depression. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our exploration into Johann Hari's book, Lost Connections, uncovering the real causes of depression and the unexpected solutions. It's based on three years of research into the treatments, causes, and secret truth behind a global pandemic. Previously, we've covered how little we know about depression. The clinical understanding of both the causes and the treatments of depression have been severely lacking. Now, we're going to look into some of the true causes behind depression. Unsatisfied with the medical establishment's explanation of depression, Hari addresses what he believes are its true social and psychological causes. The common thread among them is disconnection. The first kind of disconnection is from meaningful work. In 2011 through 12, a large Gallup poll found that only 13% of respondents felt engaged by their work. This means that the vast majority of us are not. If you deaden yourself to dull, repetitive conditions at work, it's hard to reawaken yourself when you get home. 
Hari cites a famous study of the British civil service in the 1970s by the epidemiologist Michael Marmot. He surveyed 18,000 workers at different levels in the hierarchy to discover who showed the most symptoms of stress. Marmot found that it wasn't the bosses, but workers at lower levels and pay grades who were more likely to be stressed. They had less autonomy and status. Another cause of depression is societal change. We used to live as part of communities in which we shared our lives with our neighbours. These days, most people's idea of home has shrunk to the four walls of their own house. This has led to a rise in loneliness that hangs over our culture like a thick smog. Here's Hari on Democracy Now! talking about tribes and belonging. Humans need a tribe. And the Amish live in ways that are much closer to that constant communal contact that, that human beings evolved to have. They have a very deep sense of meaning and purpose, which is lacking so deeply for the rest of us. They, they're extremely equal. Many studies show the negative impact of loneliness on our brains. This may be down to the ancient evolutionary advantages of living as part of a group. On the plains of Africa, for example, separation from the group meant you were much more likely to die from illness or be eaten by a lion. These life and death fears left us with a strong instinct to connect. Social scientists have shown how community involvement in all sorts of areas declined steadily during the 20th century. Simply being around others doesn't eliminate loneliness. For genuine connection, there needs to be a meaningful, two-way interaction that helps both sides. Doesn't the internet and social media make us more connected? According to Hari, nope. These are a parody of true connection. To feel happy and connected, we need face-to-face -face contact. Hari looks at cultural values he thinks contributed to the rise in depression. He starts with consumerism, which boils down to the belief that owning more things will increase your social status and make you happier. American psychologist Tim Kayser found that more materialistic people tended to have more mental health problems. He makes a distinction between intrinsic motivations and extrinsic motivations. Intrinsic motivations are things you do because they're important to you. Extrinsic motivations are things you do because you think you'll get something in return, like buying things to impress people. If you're materialistic, you spend less time in a state of flow, totally absorbed in something you value. Your relations with others are worse. You worry more about people judging you. And some of your basic human needs, like making a difference to the world, aren't being met. For obvious reasons, Nearly all advertising encourages us to pursue extrinsic goals. So why don't we make the decisions that we intuitively know would make us happier? Because our culture pushes us to stay on the consumerist treadmill. Hari tells us another, even more worrying external cause of depression. He describes the Adverse Child Experiences Study. This became known as the ACE study. It surveyed 17,000 people about their childhood experiences, their medical records as an adult, and depression. The key finding was that the more childhood trauma subjects reported, the more likely they were to be depressed. Hari speculates that this is because of the way children tend to believe that trauma or abuse is their fault. In believing this, they regain a sense of autonomy. If something is your fault, you might be able to control or influence it rather than remaining vulnerable and helpless. This way of thinking helps people cope at the time, but if it continues into adulthood, it becomes damaging. Remaining disconnected from the real causes of childhood trauma can lead to depression in later life. He discusses studies of primates, showing low-status members of groups displaying signs of depression and higher cortisol levels, which are related to stress. The psychologist Paul Gilbert has described depression as being part of a submission response in a society where wealth, beauty and fame are prioritised 
Depression is a natural response to the sense of humiliation or envy this creates in people who are not high on these measures. In this context, it's worth noting the work of epidemiologist Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson on the psychological effects of inequality. In The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone, they provide clear evidence that the more unequal your society, the more prevalent most forms of mental illness are. Very unequal societies, such as the US and the UK, for instance, have higher rates of depression and anxiety than Scandinavian and European states, which have a social welfare model. Drawing on primate studies again, Hari looks at disconnection from the natural world. Low-status bonobos show signs of depression such as lack of self-care and sitting apart from the group. But these signs become much more exaggerated in captivity. Could the same be true for humans cut off from their natural surroundings? Many studies have shown that mental health problems tend to be worse in cities. According to biologist E. O. Wilson, nearly all animals become distressed when they are removed from the landscape they were designed to live in. Why is nature so beneficial to mental health? Hari surmises that nature reminds us that we are part of something bigger than ourselves and encourages us to get outside our own heads and spend time in nature. Hari also explores the idea that having no sense of a hopeful or secure future can be detrimental to mental health. When he was depressed, for example, he felt as though the future had just vanished. Studies of Native American people living on reservations in Canada showed that they suffered most when they didn't have agency over their own futures. When people lack control over their destinies, they can't plan for the future. This is increasingly the case for many of us, thanks to the insecurity of the so-called gig economy. But not only that. The lack of a clear future or security makes people feel that their lives just don't make sense, which can be even more debilitating. For his final two causes of depression, Harry turns to biological factors, genes and brain chemistry. Despite the emphasis he puts on external factors, he admits that most scientists agree biological factors do have a bearing on depression. Rather than being a fixed entity, the brain is in constant flux, restructuring itself in response to external and internal stimuli. If you experience several difficult things over a short time, the brain may adapt itself to pain to such an extent that the synapses linked to pleasure responses may start to shut down. This can be a doorway into prolonged unhappiness and depression. There seem to be genes associated with depression, but they need to be activated by negative experiences. The genes increase your sensitivity to depression, but don't cause it by themselves. Truly internally caused depression affects only a tiny minority of people. We cling to the conventional wisdom on depression being caused by brain chemistry or genes because it's easier to understand and accept. It's easier to patch people up or give them some pills than to look at the negative effects of Western society. We don't want to admit what our culture is really doing to us. Depression is in fact simply a natural and understandable response to the world we live in. When we view it purely as a disease with internal causes, it leaves the patient disempowered and reliant on medics to help fix their dysfunctional brain. In contrast, argues Hari, seeing depression as a result of culture, society and environment empowers people to see what's wrong and take positive, lasting steps towards change. We'll take a break for now, but first, Let's recap what we've learned this time from Hari's Lost Connections. We covered how depression might actually stem from disconnection. Cultural structures, statuses and consumerism push us to feel adrift from others. As social animals, we must bond with other people. Next time, we'll conclude our discussion by exploring alternate and possibly life-changing antidepressants. Then we'll reflect on the book's impact as well as criticisms regarding its author. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? 
If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our discussion on Johan Hari's book, Lost Connections, uncovering the real causes of depression and the unexpected solutions. Previously, we've explored how depression isn't always caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. It's also caused by disconnection and the need to belong. Here's Hari describing to Uplift the sort of conundrum modern society faces. We are the loneliest society there has ever been. There's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none. We'll end by exploring Hari's alternative methods of antidepressants. Then we'll reflect on the book and the author's controversial history. There's a Cotty public housing project in Berlin, right by the line of the old Berlin Wall. Dilapidated and run down, it's mostly inhabited by Turkish manual workers, left-wing squatters and people in the gay community. Around 2011, rent increases began to force them out. Although the inhabitants previously had little to do with each other, they came together to protest in the street. Gradually, the protest built momentum and they worked alongside one another. The residents forged new, sustaining connections. The neighbourhood felt like a real home for the first time. One of them told Hari, By caring for each other, we grew. Hari was deeply impressed by what he saw. The Cotty residents weren't depressed, but here's a compelling example of the power of connection. Thanks to the West's emphasis on the individual, Hari argues that we've become imprisoned in our own egos. Rejecting the conventional advice to be yourself, he suggests that the best advice is to be us. Rather than try to solve problems on your own, do something for someone else, or for society in general. This alternative antidepressant is simple, connecting with other people. Hari visits a medical centre in East London where Dr. Sam Everington has pioneered a form of social prescribing. Depressed patients are offered a choice of volunteer groups to join. One group of patients is turning a local patch of wasteland into a community vegetable garden. The regular commitment and patience required, along with opportunity to connect gradually with other people and with nature, results in real improvements for the people who joined. Hari describes this, as a restoring of human nature. We mentioned already the idea that lack of meaningful work can be a trigger for depression. Hari acknowledges that if someone is battling just to hold on to their job, it seems unrealistic to expect them to go out and find something more fulfilling. But he gives examples of workplaces, like a bike repair shop he visits in Baltimore, where the workers have come together to create a truly democratic cooperative. Because there is no hierarchy with a boss at the top, everyone feels part of the decision-making process. Their enjoyment of the job increases, even if they're still basically doing the same work every day, fixing bikes. What about a greater connection with meaningful values as a means of warding off or curing depression? Hari gives an example of how this can work in practice. In 2007, the government of Sao Paulo banned all outdoor advertising. 70% of residents agreed it made their city a better place. Studies have demonstrated that when groups of people came together to help each other and live according to their intrinsic values, it leads to higher self-esteem. Hari reminds us not to take values for granted. If they have made us feel lousy for so long, they are changeable. We don't need to be imprisoned by them. It seems a big ask to connect values, personal and societal, with depression. But we have to look deeper if we're to rid ourselves of the scourge. Turning next to psychological antidepressants, Hari looks at the power of meditation and spiritual practice. Their chief benefit is overcoming the addiction to self, 
to seeing everything that happens in life according to how it makes us feel. Meditation has been shown to be effective in encouraging a more positive attitude towards ourselves, better relationships with others, and more compassion, as well as a feeling of deep connection with the world around us. Hari focuses on a type of meditation called sympathetic joy. The idea is to actively practice feeling joy for other people's sources of happiness, whether it's our friends and loved ones, or strangers, or even people we actually dislike. If we allow it to be, other people's contentment can be an unlimited source of joy. Hari also looks at research into psychedelic drugs like LSD and psilocybin. These achieved similar results to long-term meditation. Both techniques can open the gate to what we know deep down we truly need. He also briefly mentions other psychological solutions, including prayer and talking therapies, like cognitive behavioral therapy. However, he quickly dismisses them as short-lived, saying they're effective only in combination with social solutions. In terms of a psychological solution to depression caused by childhood trauma, Hari points to some interesting research. Doctors treating patients who suffered childhood trauma asked them about it and expressed sympathy. There was a 35% reduction in the patient's need for medical help the following year. Since shame is a key characteristic of trauma sufferers, it seems that merely having their experience recognized by an authority figure addressed a basic human need. Hari isn't a scientist, and admits it. For many readers, the lack of scholarly rigor is compensated by his personal experiences and fascinating examples. Lost connections resonated deeply with people who were depressed or endured the misery of a loved one going through depression. The book was featured on the Sunday Times and New York Times bestseller lists and was endorsed by Elton John, Naomi Klein and even Hillary Clinton. But the book met with criticism from scientists and science journalists. The choice of experts Hari cites is limited and includes very few doctors who actually treat people with depression. He's also been accused of selective handling of evidence. Hari sets up antidepressants as a straw man and doesn't provide examples of people who were helped by antidepressant medication. He barely mentions talking therapies, such as cognitive behavioural therapy. Britain's National Health Service prescribes this therapy along with use of antidepressants. What's the current evidence on antidepressants? In 2018, leading medical journal The Lancet published research that looked at virtually every study done into the efficiency of antidepressants including some from pharmaceutical companies that weren't published. The evidence was clear. Antidepressants do help alleviate depression. The effect is modest, but it goes well beyond the placebo effect. Perhaps the answer for sufferers of depression is some of Hari's solutions combined with medication and talking therapies. It doesn't hurt to cover the chemical and social bases, particularly when the causes of depression are still so murky. Controversy does surround the author. In 2011, Hari misattributed quotes in his work as a journalist for the independent newspaper. He gave the impression that quotes from his interviewees' books were reported directly to him, and he tried to undermine his critics by anonymously editing Wikipedia articles on them. These criticisms and the apologies that followed were well covered in the media, and Hari remains a controversial figure. To compensate, Lost Connections contains extensive endnotes, and Hari uploaded the audio interviews from the book's research on its website. These issues notwithstanding, the way that Hari widens out the possible causes of depression is both imaginative and inspiring. Lost Connections is an argument but for the casual reader, it's rather convincing. It's hard to disagree with Hari's passion for greater connection as the answer not just to depression, but to happiness and fulfillment. Before we wrap up our discussion on Hari's lost connections, let's go over everything we've learned. We started by exploring just how little we know about depression. Much of the common knowledge specialists have utilized is based on flimsy ground. 
Then we covered how the cause of depression might be based on our growing detachment from society. As social creatures, we must belong. Then we covered some alternative antidepressants. Hari explored everything, from talking therapies to psychedelic drug use. He says that the best drug is often just contributing to a community. We'll let Hari close out. Here he is one more time, talking with Uplift about something a friend told him. The way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. The most effective ways of dealing with depression and anxiety are the ones that deal with the reasons why we feel so bad in the first place. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.